Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to just kick us off at this point. So I wanted to welcome everybody to the Ontario Underwater Explorers virtual dive. And tonight we have a talk on the HMS Speedy. A little bit of uh, background, oops, on our club. We're 55 years young. Well, maybe 56 this year. And uh, I think that makes us eligible to get the vaccine. So that's a good thing. Um, outside of the lockdowns, we're based in the Etobicoke Olympium. It's a 17 foot deep pool. And that was the foundation of our training and practice on our Thursday night uh, club nights. And as for what's happening now, we're having these virtual dives. We're still very active. Uh, we've got a full dive season, which you'll see in a minute. And uh, pretty much we just like to have fun and uh, get diving. So for people who are not members, thank you for joining us tonight. A uh, little housekeeping. If you're not going to be speaking, and uh, that's going to be for a majority of this, uh, please mute yourself. Uh, the background noise can be interruptive. And the other thing is it is being recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, um, don't turn your camera on. And if you have a question, you can always type it in the chat and we'll be able to read it to uh, Dan and the other people who will be joining us. We're going to have a, a quick dive season update. This is mostly for our members, but for people who are not members and you want to dive with us, uh, you can see that we're getting out this summer and there's uh, a few spots available. And um, uh, subsequent to that, we're going to have Dan, our, uh, Dan Buchanan, who is the uh, special speaker tonight. And subsequent to that, we will have questions. So you can either type your questions into the chat or um, at that time, uh, ask it live. Our dive season right now, we've got some spots in our Tobermory July uh, charter. You can see there, there's four. And in Picton, we have one. Uh, we're going to Tobermory twice this year. And our second charter, we've converted it to a walk-on, which means that you know you can join us and dive uh, just for the walk-on fee through Divers Den, who is our charter operator. And unfortunately, Brockville is full. All the warm water divers are, are uh, excited to go, so we're full up. If you want to join us this year, you can contact our dive director, Louis Pierre Daganet, and that's his contact information there, or just send an email to ouescuba at gmail.com. Tonight, as uh, you saw in the advertising, we've got Dan Buchanan, who's going to share with us the nautical nation changing story of the HMS Speedy. In advance of that, I wanted to highlight uh, a couple of people who've joined. Uh, one is uh, uh, got a website called shipwreckworld.com. I'm either going to watch this chat. Uh, shipwreckworld.com. Um, one of the people who Dan invited to join us has been responsible for finding shipwrecks and, in fact, found the Speedy. And, uh, well, well, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And also, uh, where you've got the Marine Museum of the Great Lakes in Kingston. Uh, Doug Crowey is joining us. I wanted to introduce Dan tonight. Uh, Dan is engaged in uh, many of the history, history activities related to local and Ontario history. He's providing fascinating stories of Ontario history presented with humor and passion in person and virtually. Uh, Dan is uh, a historian and an author. He's a founder of the annual Brighton History Week. And in February of 2020, the eighth consecutive event included a unique presentation by the history guy called the Every Picture Tells a Story, as well as a popular open house. He is the creator and manager of Trees by Dan, which is a genealogy website, a database of over 100,000 individuals, including details about many early settler families. So if you've got some Canadian history, Dan is the man you want to talk to. Um, a lot of the settler families from Prince Edward and Hastings and Northumberland counties. He's called this approach the community genealogy, which is a unique blend of history and fam uh, local history and family. Dan's written three books, and the most recent one, which is the topic of tonight's talk, uh, released last year in 2020, is The Wreck of the HMS Speedy, The Tragedy That Shook Upper Canada. And this book represents the story of the Speedy, the British gunboat that disappeared in a storm near Presqu'île, in 1804. 
Tonight, tonight, Dan will share these dramatic events and the new information about the research of the remains of the ship in the early 1990s. And these files are from never before published personal papers of the professional diver from Belleville who believed he had found the Speedy. So the question remains, uh, have we found it or is it still a mystery? So a uh, couple of things as Dan's gonna speak to us about that tonight. And you can also get that book that I mentioned that was released last year. So one caveat, uh, a lot of people on this call tonight are divers. I will say that Dan is not a diver. So don't ask him about tables or decompression or anything like that. Uh, he's not an archeologist either, but he's an historian and a writer. And it will be very clear after tonight's presentation why he wrote the book and uh, you know, don't ask questions around diving. So uh, again, uh, as mentioned earlier, this is being recorded. If you miss it or you miss some portion of it, you can watch it on our YouTube channel later on. And again, if you don't wanna be recorded, please turn off your camera and don't ask questions um, in audio format during the um, question and answer form format. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dan tonight in a digital persona and our club and our guests welcome you, Dan. So if you'd like to share your screen, please, uh, you can take it over. Okay, here we go. Everything looks okay. good here. Okay, we're all set. Thanks, Dan. Got to get everything going. All right, thanks very much. Uh, well, good, good evening, everyone. Uh, and thanks for connecting. Well, I'm delighted to be a guest speaker for a meeting of the Ontario Underwater Explorers Scuba Club. And yes, this is my first time talking to a scuba club. And I, I can only hope I don't say anything too stupid. <laughs> uh, please feel free to correct me if I do. Uh, regardless, thanks very much for this opportunity. And before I get in, I begin, I would like to recognize my two guests. Uh, first, Jim Connard, uh, who many may remember, was the leader of the team that found the wreck of HMS Ontario in Lake Ontario in 2008. Jim has spent several decades doing underwater exploration in Lake Ontario from his home on the U.S. side. And the list of shipwrecks he was involved in locating is a long one. My second guest is Doug Cowie. He's the manager of the Maritime Museum of the Great Lakes at Kingston. And Doug is very interested in the Speedy story because it's an important part of Canadian maritime history, but also because it presents us with a mystery that can be solved. Well, gentlemen, thanks very much for joining us tonight. I believe the story of HMS Speedy should be of interest to members of a scuba club because the story revolves around an important marine disaster in Canadian history. And because the lingering mystery of the story deals directly with underwater exploration and diving. So I hope you find it interesting and enlightening. And as a historian of Brighton has mentioned, I've recently published this book, The Wreck of the HMS Speedy, The Tragedy That Shook Up Our Canada. So tonight I want to go over some of the events that led up to the loss of the Speedy, as well as to talk about the search for the remains of the Speedy that was undertaken in the early 1990s. Uh, there's still a good deal of disagreement and mystery surrounding the final resting place of the Speedy. And I'm in a position to cast some light on the reasons for these disagreements and the nature of the mystery. But first I wanna tell you why I've written this book at this time. Here's the answer right here. In the fall of 2018, I received a phone call, and a few hours later, this box of documents ended up on my table. These are the personal papers of Mr. Ed Burt. He was the professional diver in Belleville who, in the early 1990s, spent three summers searching for the remains of the Speedy out in Lake Ontario. Sadly, Ed passed away in the fall of 2017. And a year later, his family that history guy in Brighton should have his papers. We had worked together on promotional issues for a few years, and they believed I might give Ed's story a fair treatment. So as I looked at that box of documents, I knew that my next book would be about the Speedy. Let's look at the events leading up to the loss of the Speedy. In May of 1804, a pair of brothers, William and Moody Farewell, returned to their fur trading post on Lake Scugog to find their associate, John Sharp, murdered. 
Well, they buried the body of their friend as best they could. And the next morning they paddled south across Lake Scugog and then walked down the Scugog carrying place to the lakeshore near present day Oshawa. At the lakeshore, they listened as a local settler named Elazir Lockwood described how the night before he had overheard a young Mississauga man brag to his buddies about how he had bashed in the head of a white traitor. This young man's name was Agatonica, and he was very proud of what he had done. According to the customs of his people, he had gained restitution for his family in light of the death of his brother, Whistling Duck, a year before at the hands of a white settler. So at least at the Mississauga camp, there was no mystery about the death of John Sharp. However, their chief, Wabakishiko, was very alarmed at this turn of events. He feared for the safety of his people. And he was forced to make the very difficult choice that young Agatonica must be handed over to the authorities. So the next morning, he led his people to their canoes and they paddled down the shore of Lake Ontario towards York. Their destination was Gibraltar Point, which was the traditional campground when they went to that area. The next morning, Moody Farewell and Elizir Walkwood launched a canoe and paddled down the shore of Lake Ontario, also heading for York. Their objective was to report the murder of John Sharp to the authorities there. Moody Farewell and Elizir Lockwood headed straight to Parliament House, as you see it here. And they reported the murder of John Sharp. Two men in this building were alarmed at this news. Lieutenant Governor Peter Hunter and Chief Justice Henry Alcock. They ordered the arrest of Tanaka, and he was incarcerated in the home district jail, which you see here. As the prisoner was being secured in jail, the authorities considered their dilemma. They worried that a murder trial held at York would inevitably mean the hanging of a Mississauga man right there in the home district jail, while all of his families and family and friends were camped right over there across the bay at Gibraltar Point. In light of this, the authorities were certain they needed to avoid holding a murder trial at York. Soon, Chief Justice Alcock found a solution. He focused on a law that said, a murder trial must be held in the courthouse of the county town of the district where the crime took place. Now, this was a fairly simple law and usually easy to apply. But in this particular case, there was a problem. Before 1802, Home District used to spread from west of York all the way to the Trent River. Then Newcastle District was created to the east, and the border was here around present-day Oshawa, north across Lake Scugog. By 1804, only the first couple of concessions had been surveyed for new settlers coming in. So north of there, it could not be technically and legally determined which of the two districts contained the farewell trading post. So Chief Justice Alcock ordered a survey, and the survey determined that, in fact, the trading post was seven miles east of the border. And that was critical because the trial of Agatonica would not be held at York, the county town of Home District. It would be held way down here at Presqu'ile at the town of Newcastle, which was the county town of Newcastle District. So the authorities were relieved at this. By the end of September, the only ship in York Harbor was HMS Speedy. Its captain, Lieutenant Thomas Paxson, was given orders to prepare his ship to accommodate upwards of 20 people and their baggage and prepare for the trip to Newcastle. Departure was set for Sunday, October 7th, early in the afternoon. The captain was shocked at his orders. It was October. It was outside the safe sailing season on Lake Ontario. And besides, it had been a terrible season for storms and bad weather, and his ship was much worse for wear. Captain Paxton actually refused to sail. Well, Lieutenant Governor Hunter was not amused. He simply threatened Paxton with court-martial if he disobeyed an order. We can expect that Captain Paxton had his wife and children in Kingston in mind when he relented and agreed to sail, but he wouldn't be happy about it. HMS Speedy was a twin mast schooner that had been launched at Point Frederick Shipyard in Kingston in September of 1798. Now there are no sketches of the Speedy itself in the records, but features of similar ships at the time suggest these estimated dimensions. 
this artist's rendering of the ship was labeled by Edbert to suggest that the ship was, well, 56 feet long and the other dimensions you can see. You know, frankly, I call this kind of ship a government taxi. It was designed to transport lots of cargo and some passengers between Kingston, New York and Newark. It was built for tough, demanding daily work. So nothing fancy. The only unusual thing about HMS Speedy and its sister ship, HMS Swift, was that the authorities had decided at the last moment to add another two and a half feet to the railing around the deck. And this was to carry more cargo. Well, this reflected the growing demand for shipping on the lakes at this time, but it also resulted in two ships that were ungainly and difficult to handle and unpredictable in bad weather. Captain Paxton had been captain of the Speedy from the day it launched, so he had learned how to manage these problems, but it was always a challenge. At this time, the Speedy was about six years old, so very near the end of its expected lifespan. Ships built by the Provincial Marine at this time were constructed of green, uncured pine timber, which meant they rotted quickly. So every year, these ships had to go into Kingston the Point Frederick shipyard in Kingston for a major repair just to get them back on the lake for the next season. As a matter of fact, there was uh, work on the books already for the Speedy and the Swift at Kingston shipyard once they got back to Kingston at the end of the season. <clears throat> Here's a document from the archives that Ed Burt used to <laughs> wave in front of us. And he used this information to estimate the dimensions of the speed. If you look closely, you can see up here in the upper left corner, it says length of the boat, 56 feet. Ed often told us that this was a sketch of the speedy in the planning stages. However, further investigation shows that this image is included in the plans for a ship that was being built as the speedy was lost in the fall of 1804. I believe, uh, although not certain, that this would be the Duke of Kent which was built at Amherstburg and launched in 1805 and would be sailed in Lake Erie. Now we need to remember that this was six years after the Speedy was built and the design of this ship would be enhanced in many ways by the developments in technology and expertise over that period of time. It is really difficult to estimate the specific dimensions of the Speedy itself, but you know, we can safely expect that it was similar and likely smaller than this diagram suggests. On Sunday morning, October 7th, 1804, Agatonicut was fastened in chains in the hold of the Speedy and passengers began to board. They were anticipating an early afternoon departure. However, we have a report that the Speedy ran aground before getting out of York Harbor. Now in those days, before all the dredging and the commercial wharfs on the shoreline here, the shore was very shallow, marshy in places and full of sandbars. And combine that with the problem of the westerly prevailing winds, when you're trying to sail to the west out a narrow channel, and you have a recipe for groundings. The soldiers at the garrison here were quite accustomed to taking a bateau out and trying to help a ship nudge itself off a sandbar. In this particular case, there was no damage and Captain Paxson was able to disembark within a couple of hours. However, the delay meant that their arrival at Newcastle would be later, into the evening, in darkness, which oh, always prevents more of a challenge. You know? Yeah. Okay. Right. Captain Paxton knew very well the nature of the challenge. This nautical chart of Preskill Point and area is from the 1890s, uh, shows us the middle ground shoal. This is a large rocky shoal that's fairly shallow that extends out from Preskill Point. Our, our lighthouse would be right here. Uh, now, don't be fooled by this channel that was dredged through the shoal in the 1870s to um, solve this problem for the larger ships of that era. But in 1804, Captain Paxson would have had to sail all the way to the east end of the entrance to Preskill Bay locate what was called the old channel, make a sharp westerly turn and sail down the channel 
till he came to a place just a little north of this small peninsula that was called Salt Point. And then he would go around Salt Point and the wharf where he would tie up would be right there to the west of Salt Point. Now this demonstrates why a beacon fire was traditionally built on Salt Point to help ships come into the bay. And why later on a series of small permanent lights were installed to provide the same support. Sailing into Presque Isle Bay was no easy task for larger ships, and in bad weather, it presented a very dangerous challenge. Captain Paxton had sailed into Presque Isle Bay many times, and he was very familiar with the problem. The weather held as they sailed through the night. But then in the morning of Monday, October 8th, the wind picked up and the clouds filled the sky. By afternoon, the Speedy was being pushed towards Newcastle by a strong westerly storm. Then, sometime in the evening, a nor'easter hit the area. We know this kind of storm it happens in the fall, comes out of northern Quebec and blasts down across the Great Lakes in a northeast to southwest direction. This was a vicious storm. It brought low temperatures and high winds, and it lasted for two full days. The Speedy was not seen again. After the storm passed, the people at Newcastle spent several days scouring the shoreline in every direction, looking for just a sign of the Speedy. Not so much as a stick of wood or a piece of clothing was found, nothing. Then on the 19th, Lieutenant Colonel John Vincent, who was commander of Fort George here down at the mouth of the Niagara River, wrote a letter to York reporting that items from a ship had been sighted about 40 miles east of Fort George on the US shore at a place called Oak Orchard Creek. Six days later on the 25th, a second and confirming letter arrived at York to leave no doubt. And it included the final evidence saying, the name of Paxton was on the lantern of the binnacle. This confirmed what everyone feared. HMS Speedy had in fact been destroyed by that vicious storm on the 8th and there was no hope for the 20 souls on board. This was the only contemporary report of any remains of the Speedy being found. So let's fast forward to the modern age. This is Mr. Ed Burt. Ed grew up in Belleville and he loved diving from an early age. He gained an engineering degree at Carleton University in Ottawa and over the next several decades he built up two enterprises. Uh, first was a metal foundry that specialized in marine products. And second was an underwater exploration and salvage company called Ocean Scan Systems. Well, Ed developed a lot of expertise with the tools of his trade, including this popular Sea Auto, the remotely operated underwater video camera. Jobs that Ocean Scan Systems undertook were varied, but they included things like finding a small aircraft that had crashed in a Northern Ontario lake, or on occasion, the nasty work of pulling bodies out of submerged vehicles. They routinely worked with the law enforcement agencies, the RCMP, OPP, and Coast Guard. They often trained OPP divers. Well, there was no lack of demand for this kind of expertise. In the summer of 1989, Ed Burt and his crew were conducting training sessions for OPP divers on Lake Ontario, southeast of Presque Isle Point. They were operating over the shallowest point in a large underwater plateau called Dobbs Bank. Suddenly, one of the divers came up to the boat and handed Ed a coin he had found on the ground under the water. Ed quickly saw that this was a very old vintage. It had the date 1732 on one side and the writing was in Spanish. Well, this in fact was a piece of eight and Ed was very intrigued by this find, to say the least. Only a few weeks later, Ed and his crew were again working over Dobbs Bank. Now, I provide this nautical chart to uh, provide an orientation for Dobbs Bank, but let's start up at the left hand, upper left-hand corner. Here's the town of Brighton, and I'm sitting right now, right about there, talking to you. South of Brighton is Presque Isle Bay, beautiful spot. And south of there, of course, is Presque Isle Point. Now, Presque Isle Point is mostly covered by Presque Isle Provincial Park, but along the North Shore there is the cottages and the homes, which is part of the Bright Municipality of Bright. Our beautiful lighthouse is right out at the east end. Of course, it's recently been renovated, so it is beautiful. It shines in the sun right now. 
If you look southeast from the lighthouse, seven and a half kilometers, well, you won't see it because it's underwater, but there you can see on the chart is the location of Dobbs Bank. It's about a kilometer and a half to the west of what's called Bald Head Beach, which this is the sand spits that block Weller's Bay. Dobbs Bank, a large irregular shape, and it's fairly shallow. The shallowest point is right here up at the north point, says one meter. I've had people say that if you go up there and stop in a boat, you can look down and see rubble just below the boat. And it goes off to two or three meters around at the edges as well, but it's quite a bit deeper on, around it. This second trip to Dobbs Bank for Ed and his crew was for the task of testing a new model of remotely operated video camera. They ran the cam camera uh, in the water and took pictures of the ground and, and uh, it was then recorded on a VHS tape. Remember, it's the 1990s. Well, that night, Ed took the VHS tape home with him and reviewed it just out of curiosity. Well, he was amazed at what he saw. On the ground, under the water, he was seeing items that appeared to him to be from a very old shipwreck. Now, the resolution of the video is low and the visibility in the water is poor in many places but he felt he was seeing enough to warrant investigation. Certainly the video and the Spanish coin within a few weeks set Ed Berth on a path towards exploration. Well, in order to get started, Ed contacted a professional marine archeologist he knew, and he showed him the video. Well, the archeologist said, yes, there's enough here to warrant investigation. So the archeologist set up an archeology span survey license for that season for the speedy site. And he also arranged for funding for what they call protective measures, which is really just a set of boys that they would put at the three corners of the large search area that they'd set out. Well, initially bad weather kept them off the lake. So they didn't get started with survey work until June 16th. And then Ed's, Ed and his crew began to follow the grid system that had been set out by the archeologist. Now that video from the year before had no location information. And this was a huge area. So it would be a matter of eliminating one grid square after another until they found what they were looking for. This picture was taken July 26. It shows Glen Rover, the boat that was used for survey work that year. And there's Ed sitting in Avon, the inflatable raft that was used as a diving platform. Chief diver in Ed's crew was Terry Coons, shown here with this scorching sunburn. And there's Ed's shoulder, actually. You can see there's Sandy on Avon at this moment. Terry Coons, a very, very experienced diver, having gained much of his training with the US Navy. He spoke to me at length about his work with uh, Ed and the Speedy Project. And needless to say, he worked hard for those three seasons that they were doing survey work over Dobbs Bank. Um, happily, I found Terry Coons to be much more forthright and credible and objective than Ed Burt ever could be. So I was able to learn a lot about the Speedy Project and what was found under the water from the guy who saw the things up close himself. And oh yes, there's the big yellow fish, the Proton-2 marine magnetometer. Um, Ed had access to this type of equipment because Ocean Scan Systems was an agent for fishers in Florida who sold these products. Um, you know, Mel Fisher who found the Atosha in the 1980s. Ed Burt was very much plugged into this treasure hunting world. In fact, Ed bragged about being mentioned in the Fisher newsletter. Here's one he cut out and waved in front of us. Uh, the headline says, Sea Otter locates and films World War I fighter aircraft. And then Ed Burt of Ocean Scan Systems in Belleville, Ontario has located a World War I fighter aircraft in Lake Ontario. Ed, a longtime user of Fisher Systems reports, the plane is in remarkable condition. The bombs it carried were still intact. This is Ed's third major find with his sea otter, signed JWF. Well, you can just imagine how excited Ed was to be mentioned in the Fisher newsletter. And as a matter of fact, the aircraft they did find was determined to be a shark. And that would be significant for folks who are interested in World War I aircraft. This area was used as a bombing range in both world wars. So there are lots of spent shells and wreckage from aircraft around, and this is all to the east of Dobbs Bank. So along the sand spits that block Weller's Bay. 
Ed and the crew would sometimes move to shallower water near the shore when the lake was just too rough to work out over Dobbs Bank. And as a result, they found a lot of interesting things in the periphery of the Speedy search site. Oh, here's some pictures of some of the electronic equipment they used during the survey work. And we got to remember, this is 1990, so all the equipment was from the 1980s. Uh, and for a small operator, as much as he could afford, on the left, we see the monitor that they would have watched the is coming up from the sea otter. Ed's survey sheets for the first year and a half of the project are full of complaints about trying to establish positions in the search area. He used handheld devices, and he was constantly annoyed that the readings changed from day to day and even hour to hour. Well, they wasted a lot of time on this problem until the introduction of the GPS systems, which were much better, uh, although, of course, at a greater cost. Ed was very excited about size scan sonar, and he even worked with fishers to develop better products to find shipwrecks and artifacts that were covered by sand and moss. However, in this project, the equipment he had, the size scan sonar equipment he had, well, failed routinely and was very difficult to operate. And they lost a lot of time and money trying to make this equipment work. At most days, they simply reverted back to the old familiar sea otter. Another Fisher product that Ed used was this 35 millimeter drop camera that was lowered from the, into the water from the boat. There was also a handheld version of this, which Terry Coons used on his dives. Unfortunately, very few of the pictures taken with this technology were, were included in the Ed Burke collection. In fact, nobody knows where they are or what happened to them. When I asked Terry Coons about it, he said, well, he took hundreds of pictures during his dives. When I asked him where they might be, he just shrugged and said, well, Ed had them, and there's no telling what he did with them. So there's a, a mystery to solve. This sketch of the protected area for the Speedy project shows the triangular search area around Dobbs Bank. Now, interestingly, initially in the, in the project, they were focusing on areas to the north and east, but later on, they found that items interest, of interest were mostly found to the south and west. Through the diving season of 1990, the survey work continued, but they failed to locate any of the items that Ed had seen in the 1989 video. Then, late in October, the end of the season, they hit the mother load. They moved to the next grid square and very quickly were seeing many items scattered on the ground. Ed identified items from the 1989 video. Well, everybody was delighted at this, although in hindsight, Ed would grumble that they had been on the adjoining grid square back in July and just didn't know how close they were. Such are the vagaries of underwater exploration. Here is a very important point. The archeological survey license for the 1990 season was applied for and given to a professional marine archeologist. And as a result, the most critical clause in the license said, the licensee agrees to retrieve only a limited number of artifacts sufficient to establishing full and proper identification of the wreck. Well, unfortunately, this cause was never invoked in the 1990 season because they found no artifacts until the very end of the season and when they only had time to document it. Then in the spring of 1991, the professional marine archaeologist decided not to return to the Speedy project. He said he just hadn't seen any evidence that it was the Speedy they were dealing with. Um, yes, they'd found artifacts at the end of the season, which meant they should continue. And if they found something that would indicate it was the Speedy, he'd be glad to come back and help. But in the meantime, he had other major projects he had to work on. As a result, the survey license for the 1991 season was applied for and given to Ed Burt, who was not a professional marine archeologist. And as a result, the most critical clause in the 1991 license read, retrieval of artifacts from underwater sites is not covered under this license. In effect, even though they now found artifacts, they couldn't bring them up to try to identify the wreck. Subsequent licenses would begin to use terms like do not disturb, which meant total hands off everything they found. This situation was extremely annoying for Ed Burt. 
because now they'd actually found artifacts that might help them identify the wreck, but they weren't able to bring them up. And if they weren't even able to begin to try to identify the wreck as the Speedy, then the professional marine archeologists weren't gonna be in, interested in participating in the project. And if the professionals weren't engaged in the project, it was less, like, less likely they'd be able to identify the wreck as the Speedy. It was this classic catch-22 situation. So what did they find? There it is, they found a debris field. No, it's not a sunken ship like we see in National Geographic or all your you know, recreational diver magazines. It's a huge debris field over several square kilometers with clusters of items in various places. Arguably, one of the most important artifacts they found in the debris field was actually identified in the 1989 video. This is a small cannon. This is called a carronade. It's very typical of the small cannon that were installed bound stern of small British gunboats at that, in that era. Terry Coon's chief diver said he stood over this and he said what was most interesting to him was this round raised area here in the top. He said it was like a crest or coat of arms. He thought there might be identifying information there, but it was very much covered in moss and sand. And do not disturb was in effect. So he wasn't able to scrape the moss off the crest. Well, where there are cannons, there are cannonballs. And here are only four of numerous cannonballs that were identified across the debris field. The most easily identified items they found were the masts. As we've seen, the mast, the Speedy was a twin mast schooner. Now the divers initially thought these were just logs, but when they looked closer, they saw there were two of them. They were lying very close together and they were identical. And on closer examination, they saw that they were tapered. Uh, and the specs of these items match well with documentation from the Point Frederick shipyard for that time period. Terry Coons also stood over what he thought might be the ship's bell. He said, certainly once you got close to it, you could tell it was a ship's bell. It's lying on its side beside some rocks. It was covered in very thick moss. Terry Coons, he grinned and he said, you know, one time I stood over this and I had the thought it would be such a quick job to pull out my knife and scrape the moss off the bell and see if the name HMS Speedy was you know, written there across the bell. Now, I, I don't know if the provincial marine at that time was in the habit of putting the name of the ship on the bell. It's a habit we identify in later times, but it's a fascinating idea. However, Terry Coons knew very well that if word of that kind of activity got back to the Ontario ministry that manages marine archeology span licenses, then Ed's license and the whole project would be in jeopardy. So he didn't scrape the moss off the bell. It was no secret that Ed Burt hated writing reports. In particular, he did not like doing the required annual reporting to the ministry that was required by the terms of his licenses. However, that didn't stop him from applying for licenses for the Speedy site every year, long after there was no survey work being done. That first report for the 1990 season was written by the archaeologist. But after that, Ed did the reports himself. The last major report was called the HMS Speedy Project Report for 1997. I still have no idea why he put the year 1997 on there. As you can see, it was produced in March of 2005. This report was motivated by threats from the ministry to block any new licenses that he might want. In effect, in order to continue to do li get licenses, Ed was compelled to provide some kind of report. Given the opportunity, Ed wanted to tell the story of what he believed had happened to the Speedy. As he believed it, after three years of underwater survey work. The most important page in the 1997 project report was this nautical chart that Ed created showing the estimated route that the Speedy may have taken here in the dark blue line. As Ed told the story, the Speedy was sailing from the west, pushed by a strong westerly storm and at night, Captain Paxson was not able to make that difficult turn into Presqu'ile Bay. The Speedy was blown off to the east into Weller's Bay. Now in 1804, there weren't nearly the sand spits blocking Weller's Bay that we see today. 
trapped. And Paxton would have been happy to ride out the storm in Wellers Bay and a few days later sail on into Presque Isle Bay. However, this is when his luck ran out because this is when the nor'easter hit the area. And the nor'easter blowing in a northeast to southwest direction blew the Speedy back out into Lake Ontario. The dramatic climax of the story comes when the Speedy collides with a large rock that was just a few inches below the surface of the water, right there on that shallowest point of Dobbs Bank. This was a violent collision. The hull cracked like an egg and the decking split apart in seconds and the mass toppled over and along with the people and the baggage, everything ended up in the raging lake waters. The 20 souls on board would have died in the initial collision or within seconds as the ship disintegrated around them. Then as that nor'easter continued to howl in a northeast to southwest direction, many items from the ship would gradually sink down into the water and find a resting place over Dobbs Bank. Larger items that would float would be blown off into Lake Ontario to the southwest. This is what Ed Burt believed happened to the Speedy. He believed it in 2005 when he wrote this repeat and report, and he would believe it till the day he died in 2017. Ed Burt knew very well what he had seen on the ground over Dobbs Bank during his survey work, and he believed he needed to provide a dramatic and compelling story that would explain how every piece of the ship could end up in that location and in that condition as he saw during his survey work. On the other hand, we might call it reverse engineering. Well, after all of this, where do we stand today? First, very few people have been willing to believe that there are artifacts from a very old shipwreck on Dobbs Bank. Ed's abrasive character and old school tactics and methods caused the archeologists to just reject everything he did out of hand. The result is that the conventional wisdom of today says he found nothing. On the other hand, you know, the Ed Burt collection demonstrates clearly that there are artifacts from a very old shipwreck on Dobbs Bank. We don't know if they're from the Speedy or not, but Ed's work would appear to provide information to suggest it might be possible. Now that the information is public in the form of a book, the professional marine archaeologists must get to work. The professionals must bring their boat out over Dobbs Bank, bring all their latest technology. Imagine how much better the underwater water remotely operated cameras, color, beautiful color, are today than in the early 1990s. They must also bring Ed Burt's survey sheets and use the coordinates that he recorded to find the cannon, the cannonballs, the mast, this clay pipe. Without the direct engagement of the professionals, the mystery will remain. This image shows Ed Burt. It's the introductory screen of a VHS videotape that he created for promotional purposes, and it included the video from the 1989 testing. A copy of that videotape, as you see here, was included in the box of documents that I received in the fall of 2018. And I was able to convert that material to digital for easier handling. The testing video was a major factor that motivated Ed Burt to search for the remains of the Speedy over Dobbs Bank. In spite of its low quality, this video has already proven to be effective in supporting the documentation about Ed's survey work. My experience suggests that folks who have knowledge and experience in this area want to see live video almost regardless of its quality. In fact, I want to show you a short video that I've created that contains several clips from the original 1989 testing video. I'm just going to flip over to it now. This. I love this picture because it shows Ed Burt in his element. There will be several segments here introduced by a screen that suggests what's there. There, um, there will be voiceover from Ed, so listen carefully. Uh, distinct piece of the uh, hull coming up here. We can clearly see the square ends of the ribs and timbers. 
Uh, we believe this to be a brass lantern that's uh, sticking out of the uh, sand and moss. We can see a square frame uh, with bright, bright yellow brassy uh, finish and a round loop on. It's uh, showing uh, dead center there right now. Uh, we have uh, part of an anchor and some anchor chains coming up. As the camera pans to the left, you will see it come into view. It's a black D link chain. There it is, right there on, on the bottom. I provided the still for this. There were many pieces of chain found, and this was one that was obvious in the video. Uh, coming up here, uh, the, the ROV comes up and we see more wreckage. And right dead center of the bottom is a clay pipe. It's been predated uh, 1800 and a pair of eyeglasses. Uh, there's a triangle of black square boarding axe. There we are right there. We can see the end of it. And this is wreckage on the left covered in moss. A still of this image shows that there are other, are other items here. There's a cannonball over to the left and one of those square long, narrow, square black glass bottles with a cork still in place that held ginger beer, a favorite of the sailors at the time. Uh, we have a bottle here. See it on the right-hand corner and canister shot on the um, bottom left here. And you actually see the purple color of the round balls inside the canister. Our first cannonball. This is a very poor, qual poor quality segment, but if you look in the crevice on the rocks here, there is a cannonball right down in the crevice. Cannonball clearly seen here stuck laying on the rocks. And off to the right, we can just catch the round part of a Casabelle on a carronade. This is the uh, where the anchor dragged her. Is the Casabelle on the right hand side. You can just see the uh, outline, the round part of the cannon. Vehicle moves back. There's actually a faint imprint of a coat of arms. Uh, uh, it's covered over in sand. I've deliberately left a few seconds because they keep the camera on the cannon, even though the water gets very murky for a minute, because it kind of clears up and leaves us a beautiful view of the cannon. Ed will chime in uh, at the end. We believe this to be a carronade. And Ed loved this screen with the water in the background. He uses it in his used it in his promotional thing. Ed was always in promo mode. <laughs> you had to learn that about Ed. He was always in promo mode. I'm going to flip back to the presentation at this point. Uh, here we go. Well, that winds up the presentation. I hope you enjoy this book, The Wreck of HMS Speedy, The Tragedy That Shook Up Our Canada. Uh, as the author, I would have to say with a grin that Indigo, the largest bookstore in Canada, picked up this book from early in the process. And that's one of the main reasons that we were able to actually publish it during the pandemic in 2020 in August. Uh, so it is available across the country at your major chapters Indigo and coal stores. Also, I always encourage uh, people to patronize your small independent local bookstores. Uh, the libraries have it. There is an ebook version, no audiobook uh, as of yet. If you want more information about the Speedy story and uh, my, my work as a historian, you can look at my website, danbuchananhistoryguide.com. Two things I'll highlight there. I've created a video series. It's a five-part series that basically mirrors the book, 
although of course in video you use imagery a lot more. Um, that's available on the video screen of my website as well as uh, on my YouTube channel. So help yourself to that. Um, there's also a section here called extra info. And I like to say that this is from one history geek to another. Um, this is web pages and some downloadable PDF files that contain details of uh, my historical research into some topics that are sort of peripheral to the speedy story uh, that I had to I had to know this stuff to provide context that most of it didn't then make it into the book. So I'm making these available to folks if they have any interest because there's some interesting uh, um, sidelines there to the speedy story. Uh, well, that's the uh, presentation, folks. I hope you find it interesting, and I'll be glad to answer uh, any of your questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Dan, that was great. I'm really glad that you were able to be the recipient of the legacy of Ed, because I think as divers, uh, material like you've shared from Ed really kind of excites us. You know, seeing some of those images, as you point out, some of them are a little bit blurry, but when you see them, they're quite exciting. So that was great that you were able to share that with us. Um, I'm just gonna share the screen on this side. Dan, you've, you've kind of done a little bit of already what I had planned to do here, which was to suggest that should people need to hear more about this uh, to order your book, uh, as you've uh, put out there, the additional information on your website and also the link to ordering the, the book. I think uh, it would be great to support that work that you're doing. And at this point, uh, what we can do is uh, have a look in the chat to see if there are any questions. And for those who want to ask directly, unmute yourself and uh, ask the question. Okay, I just typed one in the chat. Hi, Dan, that was a great presentation. I'm, oh, I've been interested in the Speedy since I first heard about it, not long after I got certified to dive. And I met Ed a couple of times through the Canadian Harvard Aircraft Association recovery team. Uh, they have, we have some of his items like the, uh, the ROV uh, and a couple of other things. And also some paperwork I have seen. My question is, do you know if the Blackburn Shark is still there, the aircraft? Or was Still down there, as far as I know. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, what else do I have here? Um, the submerged explosives at Weller's Bay, the UXO, that's probably from bomb practice, is it? Out of yes. Trenton? And from both wars. Oh, so okay. Yeah. World War I shells were found, as well as World War II shells. Um, quite a number of them. Cool. So if you go to dive there, you get warned off by the government, right? You're well, I think so. To that, park that, your boat. Yeah, that whole sand spit is not open to the public. Yeah, um, to, because it's dangerous. There's still probably unexplored, unexploded ordnance through there, and we've had issues over the last years of people going over to, to have picnics, and they, they get shooed away. <laughs> yeah, I heard I heard something like that. Yeah, you say if you travel over it and you keep going, you won't get a problem. But if your boat stops, yeah, they're going to come and see you, right? Yeah, it's very much a restricted area, yeah. and it's partly why I think people haven't gone around there very much. Mm -hmm. Very interesting presentation. I was glad to see that. Thank you. Cool. I'm going to look up that book too. <laughs> Any questions uh, live from the participants? Just unmute yourself and ask. The one thing I'll say is uh, the first time I heard about the Speedy was uh, once diving in Kingston, Ontario with uh, an operator who mentioned the Speedy. And the one thing he impressed upon me was that the individuals and the documents that were on that ship that were lost had a severely uh, history changing impact on Canada because had those individuals, lawyers and some of the documents that were on the ship uh, may, had been maintained, um, Toronto might have been the capital of Canada, so or York, you know. Uh, so that's one thing I found interesting. And, and, and when I spoke with Ed, uh, uh, sorry, when I spoke with Dan, I, um, I was interested in that part of it. So that, it's uh, great to hear the story. I, I will add to that, that um, 
it was the habit of Ed Burt to exaggerate. Uh, and he used historical facts more as kind of uh, <laughs> tools than anything else. Um, he wasn't really a historian and he wasn't careful about facts. Um, I tried to correct him many, many times, but he just wouldn't listen to anyone else. Um, I think I, 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 this thing about uh, what effect the loss of the speed he had and uh, whatnot is maybe a little bit exaggerated. Um, this was one boat. Now the big effect it had was because like York was a town of 450 people at that time, it was only a decade old, and they lost 20 people in one shipwreck from that town. And important people, yes, the Solicitor General of Upper Canada, several lawyers and uh, um, magistrates and various uh, policemen and whatnot. So yes, the, across Upper Canada, there was hardly anybody out there uh, that had settled that didn't know somebody who was on the Speedy. So it was perceived as a huge disaster at the time. Um, the really only thing it changed in any significant way was that, you know, that little town of Newcastle on Presque Isle Point, uh, the next March, legislators in York decided to revoke the status of county town from Newcastle, and therefore it was no longer the county town of Newcastle District. Now they did it because the, the town was way at the east end of the big long district, and they, everybody complained about it. I mean, this place had been established decade before when there was no settlers around. <laughs> so once the settlers all came in, the thing about being close to your uh, jail and courthouse building and the town that was your center of the justice system, that was important to have in the middle of the district. So it became Coburg. Well, it wasn't Coburg at that time, but uh, Asa Weller gave some land and that's why Coburg became the county seat of Northumberland County, um, which we know of even to today. And uh, the little place of Newcastle kind of withered on the vine. So it had a big effect on the people who had bought lots <laughs> at Newcastle, <laughs> expecting to have lots of government money coming in over the next number of years. But that was a fairly minor uh, impact. So uh, I guess that's why they call you the history guy. <laughs> well, the thing is, you, it's really easy to just take a few things out of a story and play it up as being the whole thing. And that's what Ed loved to do, and the most salacious things, because he was just trying to sell. He was a promoter. Uh, and geez, we had discussions. I think there's a friend of mine on board here tonight. Uh, Phil Spencer was in those meetings. You hear, you there, Phil? <laughs> he will know about that. Uh, we had uh, lots of talks with Ed, and he wouldn't agree to do an, almost anything that we asked him to do or to change the habits or the approach to things. Um, and, you know, it was another reason why nothing happened. Okay, let me just check the chat once. I don't see any questions in chat. And uh, one last call for those uh, who are online, if you would like to ask a question. Well, I, I will say, Dan, I have uh, spent some time working with you before this presentation and you added some things there I didn't know. So that was great. So it was actually quite uh, informative for me as well. So thank you very much for sharing that with us. And again, to everybody, if you uh, wanted to get the real nitty gritty of it, you can order the book and also see the extra material that Dan has uh, put out on his website. I've watched some of those videos. It's, it's, they're, they're quite good. So that's great. Uh, John, you have a question? Uh, no, but somebody else did. Oh, uh, uh, Mike. Yes, I, I typed it in the chat. Oh, Dan, have you, have you heard anything about the de Havilland vampire that went in, in the water off Newcastle in 1948? Oh, yes, I've heard about it. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know that much about it other than something like that happened. Okay, I was wondering if you might have any information no. on that. Been Remember, that I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a hobbyist. Time. I'm not yeah. a hobbyist for things like this. Mm -hmm. um, this story landed on my table as a historian. Oh yeah. And as a result, I, you know, needed to, uh, to do the whole thing. And it was a beautiful story to do because I'd wanted for a long time to do the historical story. Mm -hmm. And because I developed a method to do hist history um, and to make it an interesting story. But boy, when that box of documents came landing on my table, it was evident that I had then that second part, which I didn't want to do the book until I had something to add. Mm. 
And That's this was like yeah, in space in ACES to bring yeah. that up to date and get that information out. It's good to see that someone got Ed's some of Ed's stuff in his documents and did something with it. That's really good. I'm going to definitely get that book. No, it's, 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 as mentioned, it's great to see the legacy continue. So uh, uh, I applaud that. Thank you. Cool. Um, one thing I wanted to, to mention, I don't see any other questions, but uh, one thing I wanted to add for divers, uh, most of you have done the sweepstakes. And from what I understand, the sweepstakes is a two-masted uh, schooner, just like the Speedy was. So kind of gives you a sense of uh, the... Uh, vessel we're talking about here good if i could if i could add one just thing one thing i've been asked quite a number of times why nobody's ever gone out there and found those things again like recreational divers and people who do this a lot and i think there's two basic reasons uh first of all this is not a place physically geographically for recreational diving uh, i'm not an expert obviously but i've been told this uh it's very rough out there um, the currents are very unpredictable. And uh, the guys who were with Ed, Terry Coons, they were very experienced divers, so it wasn't a problem for them. But even then, they, were, they had to give up many days. Uh, so it's a rough place out there. Plus, you know, this is a debris field. You go out there in a boat and look down, you're not going to find anything. <laughs> you know, the stuff is scattered over two or three square kilometers here and there, covered in moss. So good luck with that. But the key reason is this notion of conventional wisdom is because the archaeologists disliked Ed Burt so much <laughs> that they just absolutely wiped him out of their planet. <laughs> and that's carried on through the generations since. So I've talked to several archaeologists in the last few years. Mention the Speedy. Says, oh, that guy was a kook and the ship went way out into the lake and was lost. Oh, there's nothing to that. He didn't find anything. That's the conventional wisdom. Mm. So that really is what this book was for, was to kind of uh, uh, tweak that. You know, I wouldn't be a historian worth beans if I didn't like the idea of tweaking conventional wisdom once in a while. <laughs> uh, and that, that's really the direct thing that's happening here. That's great. Well, I see lots of uh, comments in the chat and uh, applause, uh, reactions. That's great. Thank you, Dan. Um, any last uh, parting words? I know, Jim, you joined us uh, from our southern uh, neighbor. Um, any comments uh, from you? Oh, yeah, just a couple of things. Uh, as maybe some of you know, our team back in 2008 found HMS Ontario, uh, which sank in Lake Ontario in uh, 1780. And we were intrigued by you know, the wreck of the Speedy. And back in the fall, maybe it was November uh, last year, um, we got thinking about the Speedy. And, you know, as Dan had indicated, um, some of the wreckage came in at Oak Orchard. Now, Oak Orchard's uh, about midway between Rochester, the area that I live in, and, and Niagara. And so it's uh, southwest, uh, essentially, of where the Speedy went in. And our thought was, you know, the, uh, the Ontario, we're pretty sure the Ontario was running from a northeast storm. Mm. And, um, and then um, and it got overcome by the storm and it sank. And so our thought was, well, maybe the same thing happened to the Speedy. And maybe it really is in U.S. waters, and maybe it's yeah. off of uh, of Oak Orchard. And so that sort of led me to to say, you know what? I need to find out more about the Speedy because, as Dan pointed out, uh, I think a lot of people that were in the research and archaeologists in Canada and the U.S. didn't really believe Edbert. Uh, if you looked on his website, yeah, you saw what could be a chest, but more than likely it was a rock. And anybody can put some cannonballs down and take some pictures. And he didn't have the videos uh, that I saw on his website. So there was a big disbelief uh, that, no, oh, maybe this guy is really just trying to attract the attention to himself. And... Um, and it left a bad taste and, uh, you know, people just didn't believe it. So I 
got in touch with Dan, I think it was back in November, and we started to talk about a lot of different things. And Dan show, shared with me some of the video that you saw and, and a few other things. And we started to put the picture together. And as Dan pointed out, it really is a debris field. No, there is not any one you know, ship there. The pieces are there but it's they're spread all around and you know i got thinking well, why didn't why didn't uh, this is a great canadian part of canadian history why isn't anything why isn't anybody doing anything about it where's the ministry where's parks canada mm. and i i think the problem is is that as i said the archaeologists just didn't believe it and it was really because of ed and the way he acted um, to some of the authorities and the way he was presenting himself, it, it was really that kind of negativity just turned everybody off. Mm. But I can tell you, you know, I've found an awful lot of, I've been doing this for 50 years. So I've found a lot of shipwrecks and we've seen a lot of situations uh, with debris scattered, debris fields, debris going way across the lake. So I've got a lot of knowledge of what happens to shipwrecks. And the more Dan and I talked through all of this, I became a believer. And I said, you know, that Speedy unfortunately hit the pinnacle of Tobbs Bank and ended its sailing career there. And it's still there. And hopefully the artifacts that are, would be really interesting to everyone, Canadians and US, anybody uh, that knows about the Speedy, uh, hopefully there's a few artifacts there that can be brought back at some point in time and shared with everyone, along with the story. Uh, this wonderful historic story that, that Dan just uh, talked about in the last hour. So I've gone from a, a, a skeptic back, you know, in the 90s to I, I'm, a firm believer it's there, mm. I mean, the ship is there. So now I guess we need to get, um, you know, the authorities to do something about it and, and retrieve, you know, a few of the items that are there to share with everybody. So that's, that's my story. Thank you, thank you, that, that was- Thank, uh, Thanks, Jim. Sure. <laughs> oh, thank you, sure. I'm, Very nice. Okay. Yeah, I see a lot of uh, people thanking uh, you for sharing the presentation and Jim for the insights. That's great. And uh, maybe as the questions were posed, uh, maybe there still is a mystery and we need to just focus on finding some artifacts to validate that. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, guests tonight, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Normally, uh, we continue our virtual dive with updates. So the good news is in Ontario, um, I hear that we're set to reopen. So we may be having our pool nights back shortly. So for our members, uh, May 13th was the date that the Olympium was going to be getting um, acquiring the control of the pool back. And we are looking to get updates from the Tobico Olympium on whether we can have pool session soon. So stay tuned for that. And Dan, again, uh, thank you very much for sharing this exciting story. Uh, Thanks for Jim. the opportunity. Oh, it's, it's our pleasure. I will again show uh, the website to order the book and see the extra footage and video that Dan has uh, curated there for us. And I would like to thank all of the guests that joined us tonight. So thank you very much. And everybody stay healthy and keep <laughs> there <diving. you> go. <laughs> Jim's got his. <laughs> yes. Okay. Have a good night. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. That -bye. was great. Bye-bye. Fantastic. Thanks, Ro. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, guys. Excellent. Thanks, good night, everybody. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah. I don't. Okay.